Hey, I'm Katie Wawa and you're watching the Record Review of the year. I'm going to be counting down my top 10 albums of 2016. Are you ready? Quick disclaimer before I begin, this list is entirely subjective, so if the idea of other people having opinions in any way offends you, I advise that you click away right now or maybe just take a deep breath and relax. Cool. I'd love to see what your favourite albums of 2016 are in the comments, so feel free to type them up down below, but these are mine. Before I dive into the official top 10, I wanted to give an honourable mention to an EP that I was so impressed by this year. It's the Nova Twins' self-titled debut record. Nova Twins are a punk duo and their music is full of energy, pedal effects and witty lyrics. The artwork is also stunning and this record is pressed on green vinyl. Hopefully they'll have an LP out soon. But now, let's get to the top 10 albums. Starting off the list, at number 10, it's the Neon Demon original soundtrack. The Neon Demon was one of the best films that came out this year, although it was a little bit controversial. It's about cannibalism, necrophilia, and the world of fashion, so a real family film. Elle Fanning plays a young model trying to make it in LA, but her journey twists into a modern gothic tale. It was directed by Nicholas Winding Refn, I think I'm saying that right? Who also directed Drive, and it was also scored by Cliff Martinez. The soundtrack has similar tones to the Drive soundtrack, that sort of 70s, 80s electronic sound, as well as an original track from Sia called Waving Goodbye. Cliff Martinez actually won the Best Composer Award at the Cannes Film Festival this year as well for this soundtrack. I love when different art forms mold together to create an entire experience like this. The soundtrack comes on a double LP and it's pressed on red and blue vinyl, which is so gorgeous. At number 9, it's Gallant's debut album, Ology. I'm pulling my way Ology came out in April, but I have to confess I've only recently discovered it. A friend of mine who always has the best recommendations and actually introduced me to Grimes told me about Gallant, so I immediately went out and looked him up. Ology is an impressive debut with a fresh and exciting sound. Gallant's vocals have this soulful strength to them, and although Ology is an R&B record, it reminded me of elements of Indian electronic. Weight in Gold is beautiful, and I'd recommend listening to that first to get a feel for him as an artist. Going way back to January, number 8 is Daughter's second album, Not To Disappear. Daughter are an indie folk band and they have a very melancholic style. Every word is weighted down, every pause pregnant, and there's something so cathartic about listening to that kind of music for me. I've always loved artists like Jeff Buckley, The Cure, and Joy Division. That elevation of profound sadness really appeals to me. Not To Disappear reminded me of the XX's debut album, but with a darker vein running through it. There's a lot of reverb, and singer Elena Tomra's vocals are refreshingly honest. Doing the Right Thing is probably one of my favourite songs from the album. Like, I was trying to figure out why that was, but I just can't. Like, I just, I love it. It's so good. Lucky number seven is Lady Gaga's incredible Joanne. If I had a highway, I would run for the hills. If you could find a driveway, I'd forever be still. The vinyl pressing literally arrived last week, and if you like the record review on Facebook, then you'll have seen my initial excitement about getting this. Sangeeta and I also did a live stream of our first impressions of the album back when it came out in October, which I'll link to in the description. Joanne is such a stunningly stripped back album, showcasing Lady Gaga pure skill and talent. I love her more extravagant productions, but it's so nice to see her demonstrating that she also has this really solid musical background and technical talent. It's also a more emotional album. The title track reminds me a lot of David Bowie's early Letter to Hermione. I think what I enjoyed most about Joanne, though, is the potential that it unlocks for future Lady Gaga albums. She's no longer restricted to making this highly produced pop, and instead she's free to experiment with pretty much whatever she wants. Rounding out the second half at number six, is Radiohead's much-anticipated A Moon-Shaped Pool. Burn the Witch was an incredible lead single. From its political message to the Wicker Man references, it came at just the right time, offering an alternative voice against that mob mentality we've seen emerge in 2016. So this is Radiohead's ninth studio album, and they've really honed their craft, 
Rather than the dour banality of their earlier subjects, a moon-shaped pool transcends to a serenity both beyond and yet simultaneously of the modern world. Tom York's haunting vocals are always memorable, yet here they're even more so. There's a blend of walls of electronic music and then delicate acoustic instruments. Radiohead are just showing off really at this point. I mean, it's brilliant. The artwork on the record is also intriguing. It's these unfamiliar, slightly abstracted shapes that are reminiscent of pools and then also of moon craters. There's also this really interesting contrast between these monochromatic sections on the artwork and then these brighter sections as well. It's also a double album and they really make the most of that extra space on the records to really amp up the quality of each track. Next up at number five is the debut album from Shira, Nothing's Real. Shura has been making perfect synth pop for a while now, but this is her first LP released in July and it was well worth the wait. Her music reminds me of an early Madonna and each track strikes this perfect balance between optimism and emotional depth. I also love her lyrics and how she plays with expectations. She has a song called Indecision, which at face value is about a romantic relationship, but it's actually about her choosing a record label. Shira also hosted a listening party on Twitter where she tweeted about every song in order, answered questions about the production process, and explained all these little intricacies in the lyrics. It was such a cool thing for her to do and I really hope it's a trend that catches on, because I'd love to see other artists sort of demystifying that production process. The version of this album that I got was the HMV exclusive, which also came with an extra 7-inch single of the Space Tapes, and that features another of my favourite artists, Marika Hackman. Those tracks aren't actually included in this album, but I'd really recommend looking them up if you enjoy this. At number 4, it's the self-titled debut and final album from Viola Beach. Viola Beach have been in the news this year. You may have heard about them because unfortunately while they were touring in Sweden, they were involved in a car accident and the entire band along with their manager all passed away. Amazingly, their debut album was almost finished so it was still able to be released and it became a posthumous number one in the UK thanks partly to a lot of support from the community and also even celebrities like Liam Gallagher. Coldplay also paid tribute to them at Glastonbury covering their track Boys That Sing. My heart goes out to their families and friends and I can't even imagine how difficult it must be. It has to be said though, this album is brilliant. Fresh indie rock full of feeling and disillusion and just so much potential. Their sound reminds me of Bombay Bicycle Club, Jamie T and a bit of the Arctic Monkeys. I first heard about them through Flying Vinyl, the vinyl subscription service, because Viola Beach had featured in one of their boxes and that's now one of the only vinyl versions of their music that exists. This album hasn't been pressed on vinyl yet, but I really hope that they do. I think that there'd be a lot of support for it and I'm sure a lot of people would want to buy it. If you haven't heard this album yet, then seriously, what are you waiting for? Just give it a go, you, you will not regret it. Getting into the top three, I adored The Bride by Bat for Lashes. There's a tear in my lover's eyes. This was Natasha Khan's fourth album as Bat for Lashes. She's one of my favourite artists. I love that magic realism, fairy tale, folk tale style of her work. It just has this mesmerizing beauty. So when I heard about this album, which is actually a concept album, I was so excited. The album is like a film, following the character of the eponymous bride after she's left at the altar when her groom dies in a car accident on the way to their wedding. It follows her grief and self-reckoning as she deals with the ramifications of that traumatic event. Khan seems to be inspired by other artists I love, like Björk and Kate Bush. And I think it's pretty brave to make this kind of album nowadays when not many people actually do sit down and listen to a full album. There aren't really any traditional singles on this album, and it's actually meant to be a companion piece to a short film that Khan directed called I Do. It's true storytelling, although I'll admit that this album can be a bit difficult to get into, but once you're in the mood to sit down and just listen to a really great story, it's perfect. The record's artwork is also so cool. It's these very stark, evocative images, and it's as if they're the illustrations for the book itself. We're getting so close to the end, but coming in second is Mitski with Puberty 2. This is Mitski's fourth album and it's proper indie rock. 
The first song I heard of hers was Best American Girl, which has so many familiar, cathartic tones to it. It reminded me of Amanda Palmer, that strength yet uncertainty and honesty. Mitski's third album, Bury Me at Make Out Creek, got a lot of positive responses, but I think that this is the album that people are paying more and more attention to. Mitski was born in Japan, she's half Japanese, half American, but she also grew up all over the world because her family moved around a lot. This album addresses ideas about belonging and identity that I think are familiar to a lot of people, and it does so in a way that's accessible to everyone. Finally, my top album of 2016, Number one, it's the inimitable David Bowie with his final masterpiece, Black Star. Look up here, I'm in heaven. Was the t shirt a giveaway? Be honest. Even though Black Star was released in January, it was always going to be tough to compete with for the number one spot. I actually feel a bit sorry for every other artist who's just stood in Bowie's shadow all year because of it. When I first heard Black Star, it was that weekend when we thought that everything was normal. Critics were picking holes in it, trying to get that controversial opinion, or just like expecting it to be great. I was enraptured. And although I do hear that slower, darker jazz style that a lot of people have remarked upon, I was most struck by the way that certain songs like Lazarus seem to have this almost heavy metal influence. In retrospect, it makes sense. A lot of metal is morbid and existentialist. Were those the thoughts running through Bowie's mind? I could go on about the music itself, but I think a lot of people have done a far better job of explaining exactly what Bowie's done in Black Star. I think what impresses me the most is that Bowie created this while he knew he was dying. He could have spent his final months quietly with his family, like a lot of people would have, but instead he channeled his incredible incredible talent into this one last gift to the world. Like a true star, he went out in a supernova, in an explosion that could outshine galaxies. Well, that's it for 2016. Thank you for watching my top 10. But now I want to know, what do you think were the best albums of 2016? And if you agree or disagree, let's just have a really respectful debate in the comments. And if you're not already and you'd like to be, why not subscribe to my channel? Make sure you turn on notifications so that you'll get an alert whenever I post a new video or if I start live streaming. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next year. Bye.